accessorizing with the pen. The nails. Oh. oh. I'm like, I'm like, I'm a mess. This is not this is not an accessory. This is this is this is this is not it. Alright. Here we go. I call the plant El Man of War. The following is brought to you in part by MFC Studios. The views of the show's host and guests do not necessarily reflect those of the management, owners, or staff of this radio station. And now, it came from the radio. www.bigapplecc.com. Uh, the convention has not been announced yet, but I'm sure they will have one this year. Also, want to give out shout outs to our Patreons, of which there are Danny Grillo, award winning director Jared Morell, Kyle Horn, Millie Fortes, New State Famous Dresden Media, Unji Gun, Shadow Rabbit Art, Yasmin Ray, Rosa, and the Huracan. Want to have your own little shout out? Go to our website, www.acamefair.com, or a button on there takes you right to our Patreon page. Also on the Acclaim From Radio website is my comic book, Designated, a comic book that took 30 years to make, recently performed at New York Comic Con as a video play, and will be performed right here at the East Middle Public Library for the MCon on April 4th, uh, on April 20th and 21st. Tells the tale of two warring alien races fighting over a newly discovered power source, the war finds its way to planet Earth, and as a result, some humans gain abilities. As always, we have to talk about the sort of sad news. Let's see. Sad news. Manga artist Akira Toriyama died recently from acute subdural hematoma. Uh, he is most famously uh, known for his creating Dragon Ball, which was turned into the anime series of the same name, and Dragon Ball Z, which aired from 1986 to 1996, originally in Japan. Uh, he was 68. Are you a fan of Dragon Ball? Are you aware of Dragon Ball? Are you looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about? Sure. Come on. Come on, all right. You kind of know me by now. No idea what Dragon Ball is. Charlie, Dragon Ball? Uh, yeah. Anime? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Alright, so you're a fan of his. Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Very familiar. So, yeah, he, the creator died. He's I saw. 66, sure. yeah. That's crazy, right? So. Um, so, moving on. Some more sad news. Actor Kenneth Alexander Mitchell also died recently from Lou Gehrig's disease. While appearing in a handful of movies and TV shows, Ken is perhaps best known for his role as Sam Lucas on 15 episodes of the series Ghost Whisperer. Eric Green in 26 uh, episodes of the series Jericho, which also aired on CBS, and most recently Joshua Dodd on the new Nancy Drew TV series on the CW. He was just 49 years old. Are you familiar with Kenneth's work? I'm not actually. Charlie? Yeah. I just want to say Lou Gehrig, like, I don't know if you guys know this, but Lou Gehrig's like, how does he feel about this? <laughs> this is Lou Gehrig. How does he feel about the legacy he's leaving, you know? Well, I don't want someone to leave disease after me, you know, like you the Jeff Feldman cancer. Oh, I got that one in my groin. Like, you know? What? what? You know what? I'm not, I'm not like, taking a baby. I'm not taking a baby. <laughs> 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 <Moving on. laughs> so sad. TV executive, producer, and screenwriter Janice Burgess also died recently from breast cancer one day after her birthday. While working for Nickelodeon, she created a few shows, most notably to me anyways, was the Nick Jr. series, The Backyardigans. It was a computer-generated show described as, quote, a group of five animal neighbors, Uniqua, Pablo, Tyrone, Tasha, and Austin, 
share a large backyard between their houses. In each episode, they meet in the backyard and imagination themselves into fantastical adventures. Their adventures span a variety of different genres and settings. Many episodes involve visiting different parts of the world, traveling back and forth in time, and using magic or supernatural powers. The characters give themselves different jobs and roles depending on the episode's imaginary setting, such as detectives, knights, or scientists, with many episodes being parodies of action-adventure films such as James Bond, Star Trek, Indiana Jones, and Ghostbusters. Uh, much like children's shows of the day, uh, while only having produced four seasons and 80 episodes, the show ran from 2004 to 2013. Now, it's one of those shows where I was not the target audience, but if I was Kid Mark and I saw it, I would have loved it. So adult Kid Mark watches like, man, I wish I had somebody, uh, a kid to share this with, because it was such a really good children's programming that wasn't necessarily guilt directed towards kids, like the multi-layers, it's like the Looney Tunes, where you have the double layers of jokes and animation. And it was computer animation in its early stages. It was really entertaining. And that's one of those situations where I wish there was somebody who had a little mark to watch the show with. Are you, are you, are you going to say no? Are you familiar with the backyard again? No, but I'm going to ask my friends who made the Gooligans, Shadow Shaw King, if it's related. Okay. That's what I'm going to ask. You've heard of backyard again? I remember it, but also, yeah. side note, like the, there's a compulsiveness in me that's like, you die right after your birthday. Way to tie that up. Ah. Uh, and then, that's a, what a final point to put on. Yeah. Unbelievable animated show. What? Really? Yeah. So now we have the last bit of sad news. Oh, stop with this! You can still news. watch the show with the kids. Here is the good news. Yes, you can still watch the show. I'm sure we're not coming out with you alone. <laughs> That's no, 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 no. Uh, actress and fashion designer right Julie Lynn Charlotte also died recently. She was the creator of the pool skirt. Uh, back to the Future, if you might remember when they, back, when they went back to the future in the 50s and 60s, I've seen the first one, I'll be well aware of the pool skirt. Mm -hmm. She made that dress. It's an iconic wow. image. And she was 101 I, years old. I was around when they were wearing it. Right, so wow. that person who made that iconic, was it, was it iconic back when you were in youth? It was, it you were just a junior thing, correspondent? They called it, they called it, it was a thing for the, it, it was like, you would go out to a dance if you were a girl. You'd go out to dance with your best school skirt on. Yeah. And you had Did you like that? Your little white socks. Would you say, Elena, wear your poodle skirt? Poodle skirt. Yeah. Yeah. Would that, would that like be something that? you encourage uh, your female companions to wear back in the day? I was not able to have a companion back in the day. <laughs> to be honest. Oh. But, but that's when you used to see girls go out. They used to have those. They would like these. Big skirts and. Mm -hmm. Should we see color. more of them? Yeah. Maybe more. Well, you know, you see them in uh, Greece. You see the. Oh, okay. yeah. No, but now. Oh, now. Like Ice Spice who goes out in concerts not wearing any underwear. Oh, yeah, we're not a little skirt. Yeah, tell me that's not stuff like that always has a pattern. Bring them back. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see them. You have a chance to bring back the food skirt. You'll bring it back, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. Bring it back and don't show them. Yeah. So that's it for sad news. So moving on to the regular news. Um, the Oscars have come and gone, but we hear it came from radio. That means that the Razzies also have come out. Um, it looks like the big winner was Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, which was based off of the book, which is now in public domain that Disney has, so they no longer own that original concept. And it was that Pooh and Piglet were murderers because they were the guy's childhood friend. And then when Christopher Robbins left, they became, uh, they needed him. And so they went around murdering people in the camp. It's a very crazy movie. Uh, but, they, but they got five awards for Razzies, which is worst picture, what? worst director, what? worst on-screen combo, worst remake, ripple for sequel, and worst screenplay. Uh, with Hot Megan Fox getting two awards for her, uh, Worst actress in the movie Johnny and Clyde, which we saw, what I saw with uh, Brett Azar. Uh -huh. that, was, that was that movie. I like that movie. I have I to say. say this, yeah. And then she got worst supporting actress for Expendables Part Four. Gold. As, as Gina. So. <laughs> I wonder how she thinks about that. Like, you know, it's well, the rest, the yeah, as an actor, they're, they're, they're all in good fun. Yeah. Um, famously, Halle Berry won one. Okay. Like, I think okay. the week after she won an Oscar for Best Actress. So. 
It's it's all in good fun. I believe it's a charity benefit, and they raise yeah. money for things. I, I think. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, um, Halle Berry uh, came in and she brought the Oscar, she brought the Oscar. <laughs> to the <laughs> and she had a vote, and she's like, yeah. oh, Jackie, and uh, Sam Bullock also yeah. came down that she won, and she had yeah. So the Razzies are fun. I think they. Oh, yeah. I think they have. I thought they were all like legitimately bad. Like, like I remember that their two-year-old one was it like a young kid one. Oh, no, they were nominated. They were nominated. She was nominated for being a, like, the, the youngest person to get a Razzie, and then the social media backlash was so uh, bad right, right, right. that they were like, well, we made a mistake. We're not going to gonna nominate right. people of a certain age okay. to be uh, nominated yeah. for That's why I thought it was You have to be like, old enough to get the joke. Right, correct. Okay. I, would, I would watch that more than I would watch the Academy Awards. Yeah. Which I wouldn't watch. Yeah, there's, there's clips of the Razzies online you can go watch. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. okay. So, so audience moving on. Question. From the, I guess they have money now department. None other than Nev Campbell has announced that she is returning for Screen Part 7. Oh. Nev said, <clears throat> Sydney Prescott is coming it back. nothing like Nev. It has always <laughs> been a blast and an honor to play Sydney in the Screen movies. My appreciation for these films and for what they have meant to me has mm -hmm. never waned. I am very happy and proud to have been asked in the most respectful way to bring Sydney back to the screen, and I couldn't be more thrilled. In addition to never returning, screen creator and writer Kevin Williamson is taking over as director of Scream 7. For those who are keeping track, Kevin wrote part 1, part 2, and part 4 of this franchise. Kevin says, It's been nearly 30 years since my first script, Scream, was directed by the legendary Wes Craven. I would never have predicted that it would become or that I would be directing the seventh installment of the franchise. I am overcome with gratitude and excitement, and I can't wait to take this journey with Ned and the entire Scream family as we bring back Sidney Prescott to the next chapter of the Scream franchise. Thank you all the Scream fans, you are the gift that keeps on giving. Now, what's interesting to note is how all this came about. Before uh, Scream 6 came out, if you remember we from the show that Ned said that she was not returning because she wasn't getting fairly compensated. Then, Scream 6 came out and had the biggest box office return <laughs> out of the entire franchise without her, Whoops. Uh, making $108.1 million off of a $35 million budget. The original Scream took in $103 million off of a $14 million budget. Then, the stars of Scream 6, which is Melissa Barrett, got fired over some social media posts, what? and then her co-star, also uh, the lead, Jenna Ortega, quit the film, citing scheduling conflicts. It's most likely believed that she was quitting the film in solidarity of the other actors getting fired. Wow. Then, the original director quit, because how are you going to make a movie without your two leads? What? Or Nev. And now, all of a sudden, Nev is back, and the original creator is going to be directing it. I find this to be very interesting how this all yeah. came about. And if she would not have been fired, I think Nev would never have been brought back. What do you think about that? I, I have no idea, and I'm not going to speculate <laughs> behind closed doors that I'm not behind. But um, I've actually never seen Scream, and to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't know there were seven of them. <laughs> the I thought there were like three of them, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's like Scream beating a dead horse. Oh my god. What are your thoughts? As a, as a I don't know actor. what happened, but it's cool that Nev Campbell's back because she's like the original. And I just discovered Jamie Kenny at the podcast, one of the best podcasts ever. And now I'm back into Scream, and now I have to see all the others because I only saw the first. So yeah, it's nice to see that come back and actually care. Yeah, she could be following in uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's footsteps with uh, Halloween and right. Uh, oh, you know, maybe. And and once you get hooked with a, you you get hooked with a franchise. People remember you and eventually you come back. And maybe she's coming back for the cons with a convention because you can make a that's, lot of money at conventions that's awesome and, true. and leverage that and leverage your cameo and make a lot of money on that. Yeah. So I think it's a combination of a lot of circumstances plus karma because yeah. I think they should oh. never have had her miss out on part six. I should think they should have given her the money let her come back to number six because she built the franchise. Yeah, she's and never handled. She's right. like, oh gee, sign, sign the check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and despite the fact that, that I think the reason why number six made so much money was because everyone was curious how it would be without her. And as we've discussed many times on the show, the actual product 
does not dictate how the box office is. It's yeah. all about the hype and the sure. sizzle and everything surrounding it. Sure. So much like with uh, when they had the, the Vin Diesel and um, uh, The Rock arguing, mm. it made the film, everybody wanted to go see the film more, so it built it up. So I think that's why it made the biggest money. And if I was Nev, I'd be kicking myself in the butt, like, oh, I should have right. always been in this movie. But then all of a sudden, all of other stuff happened. And she's like, well, now, now she's in the driver's seat because nobody would go see Scream 7 without the people in Scream 6 right. and 5 or right. Nev Campbell. Right. So the studios were like, we like money. Yeah. So I think we better try to figure out the best way to salvage the situation and make us look Couldn't good. they have just gotten Drew Barrymore and Rosie Gallon and that Oh, Drew is dead. Spoilers. They did the ghost, you know, sci-fi, they go into sci-fi stuff. I'm sure you could find a way to bring anyone back. So they could probably bring yes, you like back a, a, to really get back. Yes. Yeah, and then they have other stars. And no one's not saying that Nev's not important. I'm not saying he's dead, but... Well, so you think that's the only route that they would have been able to do is try to get somebody yeah, they else just get any star. to be in it? Get Charles Machine, whatever, you know? I don't know. Do we really need that Campbell? I'm just saying. Well, Jack Nicholson. Yeah, Jack Nicholson. Forget about it. Forget about it with time. Be like, it'll be like, it'll be just as good as that movie I'm going to get in Canada. I think so. it's have been fine. That, right, just sitting there on the thing. I was calling. Call uh, call 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 back. And I think that it might be difficult to, to try to make a new, new franchise because that's what part six was, was the reboot with the new right. and the old cast and legacy uh, cast. So them trying to do it again might have not been the best way around it, but I think this is a smart, safe way to do to make this movie. All right, so yeah. moving on. Yeah. From the That's a Lot of Nuts. That's a Lot of Nuts! <laughs> the new Kung Fu Panda sequel has taken the number one spot in the domestic box office, oh. pulling in $57.9 million in ticket sales in its first week of release, beating out the Doom sequel, which came in at the number two spot, making an additional $46.2 million in its second week of release. For those of you keeping track, the aforementioned Doom is still the highest grossing film of this year, uh, with $162 million followed by the Bob Marley biopic with $89.7 million. And we've talked about how biopics are not really accurate, and they're just kind of taking a real thing and just making up stuff, because why not? And it's made the money, so that formula works. Yes? Can I tell you a story about You can. Jack Black. Who happens to be the voice right. of Kung Fu Panda? Black Panther. <laughs> he was sent to Japan to promote the film. Okay. Which was ironic because it's an animation and the voice of the panda wasn't him in Japan. Oh. <laughs> it was a Japanese. Right. So he was saying, Why am I here? Oh, yeah, that's funny. But he didn't get he got a trip to Japan, but I thought he thought that was ironic. Right, he might have been in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, ha that actually happens with all films. All films that have international distribution, okay. they have like their, and it, it's usually the same actor who does their voice of the film. Um, and a lot of times they're friends or they stay in touch or whatnot. But I think in his instance, what was funny about it is that the guy's voice is so much higher and different than his. So is that. Uh -huh. It was him, it was either him or Zach Efron. Some, something like that happened where like, the guy's voice was so different. It just very obviously was not him. But that, ha that happens in a lot of films, and they still go along with the right. yeah. it because obviously they're the big star and they're the, the draw. Yeah. That's weird if you think about it, for, especially for an animated movie, that he would be the draw, even though that, if you think about it, he's not involved in it in any way, shape, or form sure, but for the sure, international but, but if you look at any of the press in, in other countries, it's still Jack Black. Yeah, and that is weird. It's weird. It's just he's not the voice you're hearing maybe, because he doesn't speak Japanese. Maybe too. Right. he's the panda. Maybe he's the panda. He kind of is a panda. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. <laughs> that would be like the girl that Jack Black turned into in Jumanji would go out and do the promo <laughs> thing instead of Jack Black. Right, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so moving on. From the I think this might be a scam department. In Glasgow, Scotland, the House of Illuminati's, yeah, House of Illuminati's Willy Wonka Chocolate, Willy's Chocolate Experience, sorry, uh, which charged $45 per person, was quickly canceled after its first day after police were called due to multiple parents demanding refunds. Turns out that despite the website promising, quote, extraordinary props, oversized lollipops, and a paradise of sweet treats, and, quote, a once-in-a-lifetime musical experience, attendees were given a, quote, sparsely decorated warehouse 
with nothing resembling Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The actors who were part of the, the performance said, I thought this was where dreams go to die. I yeah. already could feel the embarrassment. I knew the script was AI generated as well. I was like, this isn't normal human writing. There was a little girl dressed up as a Oompa Loompa, <coughs> and that was really upset because she expected Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and got a dirty warehouse in Glasgow. There was just a mob of people outside and inside. It was carnage. There was people just running everywhere, shouting, threatening the organizers. <coughs> they told us to abandon the script. They had this jelly bean room, but they eventually ran out of jelly beans. I was already rationing the jelly beans of three per kid, and that was me being generous. The company says, <clears throat> today has been a very stressful and frustrating day for many and for a fact we were truly sorry. Unfortunately, last minute we were let down in many areas of our event and tried to best to continue and push on, and now realize we probably shouldn't have had canceled the first thing this morning. Instead, we fully apologize for what has happened. We'll be giving full refunds to each and every person that purchased a ticket. Now, it's been all over the internet. If you can see the images, that's what was promised. You look at the website, which is clearly AI made, and to what was actually there, it's night and day. Now, as an actor, have you ever been in a situation where you were hired to do one job, and when you got to the job, it was something completely different? I mean, I feel like that happens oftentimes, especially in theater, which is where I started, where you get hired to do a job, and all of a sudden you're also doing stuff backstage, just, and then your, your headspace is like, well, of course I'll just help. I just want to help. I'll do, like, that's, we'll just get it done. Um, that's not what this is. <laughs> this is just blatant fraud and a grift. Uh, and also, I think a really interesting kind of point to AI and where we're going with it and what could potentially happen if we don't get legislation in place to protect, to like protect AI. IP and to protect yeah. the people who are going to be in those projects, whether they're live or on film. Um, SAG Actor has been doing a great job with the new contract that we just negotiated, and also they've been going in front of Congress to speak to them about the dangers of AI. This is a funny example of how this could happen, but there are, of course, more serious examples of what could go completely awry with it. Um, and so I'm interested to see where legislation goes with that to kind of protect everyone from AI, because it's not just actors. It could be anyone who is on the phone, on social media, anything. Mm -hmm. This just happens to be a really hilarious example of it going completely off the rails. Like, thankfully, no one was actually hurt or harmed by this. It's well, just, financially, because sure, it's, it's been investigated yeah. that the guy who created this has been doing multiple other scams, oh. and that he has not actually refunded anybody. Oh, wow. And so it's a big thing that the police are investigating going after this guy. Like Zero Mostel and the producers. Yes, matter of fact, that's very accurate. Kind of exactly what they yeah. <laughs> Did you actually see any of the pictures or stuff online? I did, I did. So what are your thoughts about <laughs> as, as an actress? Have you ever been on the I think it's just you, it, they promise. What is it from? Paradise of sweet treats at a at an oversized lollipop. That's yeah. why I don't date anymore. As my last date promised me that he said you're gonna have a paradise of sweet treats at an oversized lollipop. I got nothing. You saw that. Well, yeah. have you ever been in a situation where you've been booked for a job and you go down there and want to get nothing? Switch. One sort of for an extra because I was told, and maybe it's my misinterpretation, I was told that the featured spot, blah, 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 and I get there and I'm like, I'm like Cadillac, it's a background thing for like Cadillac, I'm like, I, I don't want to just, I don't want to be a cab again, what is this, so, and they said, oh, you're going to get screen time, blah, blah, and it was, no, it was just bizarre. Could, could you imagine the guy at the door with the room full of jelly beans? And worked there, and he said, uh, "Welcome to the room for Joey. Uh, you can only have three." Yeah, and they were like, they were handing, yeah. they were, they were counting <laughs> off the jelly beans. It's very, it's very sad. Oh, wow. um, so moving on to the last bit of news from the the intimate part of intimacy coordinator department. Mm -hmm. None other than SAG Astra has announced a new clarification for intimacy coordinators. For those of you who don't know or care for that matter. Intimacy coordinators are defined as liaisons between actors and production for nudity and intimate scenes. Part of the new deal from the strike that we talked about on the show says <coughs> that studios and production companies must take performance requests for an intimacy coordinator under consideration without retribution. 
The clarification has come out of a recent interview with one such coordinator who is being interviewed about a sex scene between General Ortega from um, Wednesday and uh, Scream 6 and Martin Freeman in the new film Miller's Girl. Uh, Christiana uh, Arjona, the coordinator, says, <clears throat> There was many, many people throughout this process engaging with Jen to make sure that it was c consistent to what she was comfortable with, and she was very determined and very, made, and very sure of what she wanted to do. I'm hyper aware of both my talent and making sure that we're consistently checking in, and at no point are there any boundaries being surpassed. Uh, SAG says now, public release of details about an actor's scene or confidences entrusted to the intimacy coordinator without the performance consent is now unacceptable. Intimacy coordinators who fail to adhere to these rules could be removed from the SAG actors registry. So, are you familiar with uh, intimacy coordinators? Jenny? Not really, because I turned down those roles. Okay. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so you're uh, a. Yeah, I actually got to work with uh, Alicia Rivas, who was the first intimacy coordinator ever. Who was this? Alicia Rivas. She, she was the she was the first intimacy coordinator ever. She was the one that kind of coined the job title uh -huh. um, on the Deuce with James Franco. And there were five of us who were just stark naked in the background, but we were of course in the foreground. And uh, it was it was so well done. Everything was choreographed. It was a closed set, so unless you had to be there, you weren't there. Each guy was assigned their own robe person that like mm -hmm. when they called action, that person would take the robe and run away. Okay. And when they called cut, they bring the robe back out. And then you, so you weren't just like standing around yeah. with your bits out. Um, it's such an important job. We, there are so many horror stories of the industry over the last however many you know decades that we've been doing this of intimate scenes that go completely awry. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the film, but the, it's two very well-known actors from yesteryears where there was a scene where this man is chasing this woman and he gets her on the floor and he's supposed to <coughs> assault her on the floor and the director wasn't getting the reaction he wanted from her so they took a frozen stick of butter, chased her down, tied her on the floor and shoved it inside of her no. without telling her. What? And like they got the reaction that they wanted. But she was vegan. It, like, who cares? Like, <laughs> It, it's just like the, she wasn't told, it wasn't talked, she wasn't spoken to about it, and she wasn't, she didn't consent to it, oh. and that's one of thousands of stories that probably we don't know. So yeah. having this kind of person on set is like so important for the safety of everyone. But then yeah. also, it's your job. Like you go into set knowing, okay, today we're shooting this scene, and you're going to do this, mm -hmm. and then you're moving your left arm, and then you're allowed to do right, this. Right. And crossing any boundaries yeah. is how we ended up with the Me Too movement in 2018 because so many boundaries have been crossed. Yeah. So I, I think it's the most important on person on set if you're going to have any kind of nudity or sex Unless James Franco is there, and then he's the most important. Well, I would. I, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love him. I'm just kidding. Was he there? Was he there when you were nude? Yeah. So was he in your eye line when you were nude? Oh, yeah. So does that like your measurements and all? Okay, that's all. <laughs> well, what if, what if I'm just saying, I was not, so it's Franco. What if they hired a coordinator and they got the woke idea and then it's all off the wall and the movie's really fucked up? Excuse my language, right? Because you say it to be coordinated, but the woke, the same way I see in the pool, they're teaching the lifeguards, teaching people, but the woke guys teaching them, they ain't saving everybody in the pool now. Because I'm saying that's what happened to maybe over intimacy. We know what intimacy is, but what if they come with their whole idea? Are they, you know, I mean, who is the lady? She's the first lady. Out. We actually have to take our break, so we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more. It came from the ring. I mean, Hey everybody, this is Todd McFarlane of the Record Setting Spawn comic series. And if you're looking for any kind of cool conversation about creators, about entertainment, about all that good stuff, you go to It Came From The Radio. You're listening to The Great Spot. This is Clinton Flynn, uh, probably the voice actor known for Axel, Come on, uh, and Ryan from the Metal Gear series. And you're listening to It Came From The Radio. Stick around. <laughs> Kingston, the writer and creator of Edlock, and I'm WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler, and guess who you're listening to? You're listening to It Came From The Radio! Hi, this is Amy Jo Johnson, writer-director from the film The Space Between, and you're listening to It Came From The Radio. Grimlock having fun on It Came From The Radio! Now, back to our show. And welcome back to the Came From Radio, episode 
big up a con in front of a live studio audience. Hey, how you doing? Uh, at the East Hill Public Library uh, for our 78th live show. Uh, just letting everybody know that the <coughs> library has tons and tons of programming, uh, most of which are free when we did our show. Uh, we do it the second Wednesday of every month. Our next show is going to be on Wednesday, April 10th at 7 p.m. We're going to have some professional stand-up comments, Brian again. Um, April when? April when? April 10th. Okay. I thought you said April 5th. And if you go to www.eastmill.info, you can get more information on that. Like I said, they have tons and tons of programming, which is really great for the library to have. And make sure you guys go check out other stuff as well as our show as well. I'm here with Elman Jenny Kelsey, who ran away for a couple of seconds. Senior correspondent, Kelly Saladino. Hello. Yeah. And our special guest is going to be talking to us in about is Edward Mickey. Hello. So, um, actually, usually when we have a guest on the show, I've known them for a long time, but this is my actual first time meeting you today. Today. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself to familiarize with the uh, audience? Well, I mean, what do you want to know? Well, let's see. What, <laughs> we'll, we'll start off from the, from the top. What made you decide to become the triple threat of an actor, author, and producer as opposed to, or did you start off at one and then you decided to branch out to the other? Um, I don't know if there was ever a particular moment that I was like, this is what I want to do, but I grew up doing, I grew up doing shows and performing and whatnot ever since I was a kid, like knee high. Um, and so when I had the, the realization that I could make a career out of it, I was like, well, of course I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, so basically from the time I was 14 onward, I was like, well, I don't need high school anymore. I'm going to New York and I'm going to be an actor and the end. So you were 14 when you realized this can be a career? Yes, I, that was, I was 13 or 14. I'd actually come to New York and saw 42nd Street, it was my first Broadway really? show. Really? And uh, my aunt was working backstage, so we got to go backstage and meet Christine Neversold, who was there, and the wow. show, and a bunch of other things. But it was the first time that I was like, oh, this is an actual like job job. Like, I don't need to be a person. I can go be an actor <laughs> <laughs> instead. To go, so was that your first time ever in New York? Yeah. So it was your first time in New York. You go see, not only go see a Broadway play, you go see a major Broadway play, and you get the behind the scenes treatment. Yeah. That is a, that's a complete opposite of what most people would say. Just either they just go to New York for one time, either they go to New York and they go see a play. But for your very first time, it must have been a life changing, as I guess it, it is, was. experience. Yeah, from that point on, I was like, I don't care about school. I'm moving mm -hmm. here and I don't need any of this. <laughs> So then, you decide what's next for you. I mean, I barely got through high school. I moved here three days after graduation, and wow. I was just like deuces by, um, and I figured it out. You know, I mean, I, it was it was a long slog. Um, I I also wanted to do like pop music because I you know grew up loving that, and I was in recording studios with my dad, and we had a small little recording studio at my house, so I was writing music with him and like doing all kinds of stuff there. Um, so there was there was like this dual want of being Britney Spears and also do Broadway. So once I realized the downtown music scene was horrendous and I didn't want to be a part of it, <laughs> um, I started auditioning for theater stuff. Um, and it took a couple years, but stuff, you know, things finally started to stick and I was fortunate enough to work pretty much full time as an actor for about 15 years. Now, Back in the day, correct me if I'm wrong, senior correspondent Kelly Saladino, it, it was a known thing that people used to just pack up and move to Hollywood to be the mm -hmm. famous actor. What made New York? Was it because of the place you know, you came to New York, or well, it's where Broadway it? is, you know, and that's that's part of what I wanted to do. You know, television wasn't really on my radar back then. It was more like being on stage and having an audience and being able to sing, and you know, there wasn't a whole lot of TV, movie, musical things happening back then, so. The idea to go to LA wasn't really appealing. I didn't want to have to drive a car. You know, I liked I liked being in the city. It's close to where my parents are. There's like, they're only three hours out. Um, it just kind of it made sense to me, and it was I don't know. It, it just felt good, and I didn't want to waste time. In my mind, I was like running out of time actively at 17 years old, um, and so <laughs> I didn't want to waste time going to LA to sniff that out and see if I liked that. So I just I just came here. And have you left, or you've been? Here I've never left. I've been here the whole time. That's crazy. You bury me in the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you Where did you leave from? Oh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah, Central. So now you were with mom and dad in Pennsylvania, and you were what, thirteen, fourteen? 
I mean, I, I grew up there, so. No, 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 I know, but you were. Sort of the high school. When you left, when you Oh, I, I was 18, I graduated high school. Oh, okay, I thought you left there when you were 13. No, no, we, okay. we all came here as a family. Oh, okay. Listen, that, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking Italian families. No, 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 I went right down the block. Right? I, tried to, I tried to convince them to let me move here when I was like 15, 16 years old. I was like, there's the Borgia High School, there's Frank Sinatra High, I can go to one of those, like, let's get me. And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> so how do you wind up writing a book? Complete accident. I never had any aspirations to be a writer at all. I've always liked writing. Um, I was a good writer in high school. I had some things published in school paper and like poems like published in student anthologies and stuff like that. But it never occurred to me that I would be one officially. <laughs> um, and so like the whole cancer journey thing happened. And I was a couple years out and I felt very displaced in my own life. And I met someone who had kind of, he, he, he had just found out he was cancer free. And I think I was about three-ish years out at that point. And he kind of said something to me that like turned a light bulb on and I was like, oh wow, that's exactly how I've been feeling for the last three years. It's not just me. And so we had a very long conversation about all of, all of the things of feeling like a stranger in your own life and everyone around you is annoying and like what's happening and why am I angry all the time and you know this loss of self identity and trying to figure that out again um, and once he and I parted ways I was like I need to write about this I have to write about this because I've never heard of this before there's no resources for this all they do is be like join a support group and I don't want to be I don't want to sit in a room with a bunch of people like whining about their feelings I'm more proactive than that so. Um, I reached out to a couple of other people I knew who had had cancer, and I asked them some very specific questions about what life immediately after the fact was like, and everyone said the exact same thing. And so, at the time, I had a little desk job down in Chelsea, and I spent every day, five days a week, eight, like six to eight hours a day, at this desk typing away, and just like brain dumping everything out that I possibly could, um, and then went back and shaped it and edited it and, you know, got it published. It was so, a total accident. <laughs> what kind of cancer did you have? I had uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It was, uh, the official and long title of it is Rare and Large Diffuse B-cell uh, Burkitt's Lane Non-Hodgkin's Lymphoma. Very rare. Not a whole lot of people survive it. Um, I'm the only person who has survived it uh, this long without a reoccurring. So I do know someone else who had the same type, but he's had it come back three times. Wow. Um, he's now 61. He just kicked it again last year. Um, we have the same oncologist, so bless her. But it, it was um, it was quite a quite a ride. <laughs> How? So I'm going to ask you a very personal question. Go for it. Question because my mother had died of cancer, and I never asked for this, and I always have a fear of death myself. Mm -hmm. If you get that diagnosis, the prognosis. What goes through your mind, and seeing that it didn't happen, which is amazing, what goes through your mind? Oh, what a question. Um, well, I think the initial thing is um, denial, right? You kind of go through like stages of grief, in a sense, where you're like, whatever, it's fine, I'll, it's whatever. I don't have time for this, let's just do it and get it over with, and, we're, and like be, be done with it. Um, I, had a, I had a phase where that was the case, um, and then things started to really go south and no one really knew what to do and none of the treatment was working and that's kind of when I had to have the hard talk with the oncologist like nah you might not make it we're not sure what's happening wow. um, and so at that point you're like you know it just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks what are you supposed to do um, <laughs> and I did not respond well <laughs> um, pick a vice I did it and I was like how, can I, how do I cope um, you know, I was promised an oversized lollipop and some, <laughs> some, some booze and things, and I got those. Um, drank my way through chemo. Oh, wow. You know, and it was just, it was a huge spiral. I was imploding left and right, and wow. the only thing that really kept me going was that I'm a people pleaser, and so I didn't want to miss any of my appointments. Oh. I wanted to be a good boy and show up on time. Oh, my God. You know, and so um, that's, that's kind of why I'm alive. Like, my control issues and psychosis of those people <laughs> but um but yeah you kind of go through a lot of up and downs of like I got this it's no problem who cares 
to like that like hollowing out feeling of like this is it, this is it, okay, mm -hmm. this is all we're gonna accomplish. And then you spend a lot of time sitting there looking back at your life and being like, I didn't do anything. This can't be it. Yeah. And it's very frustrating and infuriating. And I think that's kind of why I wrote this book so fast, is because it was just like, get it out, you know, make it happen, hurry up. <laughs> What things are more important to you now? Um, I don't think there's any one particular thing that's more important to me now. I think it's more so that I can see things that are really not important. Well, like what things, yeah, are no yeah, longer like, important. Like, it's, it's very easy to be like, who cares? Okay. Move on. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, certainly my relationships with my friends and family have gotten much closer during that period of time than mm -hmm. to now. I call my parents every day. Um, that's also a COVID thing. When that happened, I started checking in with them every day, but it's it's stayed. Mm -hmm. And we've always we've always had a pretty okay relationship. Um, and a couple years prior to that, it got much better. And then when that happened, it was just like, if my parents can survive that, we're good. <laughs> yeah. So I guess well, it's um, well, the important thing that is that you're alive, and. Um, the alternative was <laughs> appealing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's just, um, like you said, you, you realize what's not not a problem or what's, you know. And um, what are your goals now? You know, that's such a good question. Um, they, they change all the time. You know, I, I want... I saw this really great interview with Jamie Lee Curtis not too long ago where she was saying that when she turned 60, it hit her that she still had so much creativity left inside of her. Mm -hmm. And if she would die having not gotten all of it out, then that would be the biggest tragedy to her. Mm -hmm. And I heard that and I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. So every idea or something that I want to create or do, I try to set a plan in motion to do it mm -hmm. because I don't want to leave anything behind. And by behind, I mean, in, I want to leave things behind here in, in the world, book included, but um, I don't want to have anything held back. I want to ring, ring it all out. There you go. So one thing we've talked to many actors and actresses over the years, and something that most people don't talk about is how you have to have a hard skin because rejection is part of the game. You get more no's than yeses. That's just how it works. <laughs> so going through this situation, is that not even a thing? Like, you know, just no rejection doesn't even it doesn't even affect you anymore, or does it still affect you? You know, I would like to say I would like to say that it doesn't affect me anymore. I'm not really performing anymore. Um, I was again very lucky to have done it consistently, full time, paid my bills constantly by just performing. Um, I also was fortunate enough that I created my own show, toured it around the country. That was also in my measure successful as well mm -hmm. um but i kind of was really done with it by the time like the end of 2019 early 2020 hit the time i wanted to right <laughs> i wanted to focus on my creating my own things and i was already kind of veering my head towards creating things in tv land mm -hmm. and then when the world shut down it really took gave me a second to like pause and be like actually i really don't like doing and I want to focus on other things that don't include this. Um, the funny part about that is that foolishly, I came out of retirement <laughs> uh, in 2022, I suppose that was, um, and I was on the, the National Tour of Chicago. And right before we left, I was replaced. And I've got no reason, I don't know why, it's just the thing that happens in the industry, Patty the Pump famously was replaced in Sunset Boulevard when I came over here. <coughs> She's doing under Lloyd Webber, it's the whole thing. Um, and I basically did the same thing. I, I got paid out and I left, I still don't know why. And it was kind of this reminder that like, you didn't really want to continue doing this anyway. Right. Um, and it was, it was really a very hard, like, stop and also redirect. Because everything that happened from that point forward, specifically with this book, but also in life, has been the right thing. And it's been easy, hmm. which is not something I can say for performing in theater right. around the country. Right. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, and by easy, easy is relative, but you know, like it, in comparison, it's been 
it's so much easier to do a lot of this stuff with my book than it has in anything else I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, and so <coughs> the rejection part of it, like you do get used to it, especially like in the in the circus of auditioning constantly. You're just like, well, that's just another one moving on. I really wanted it, but there's another one around the corner, so it's fine. You know, like dating. Um, and so, like, ha having the big job and feeling so close to finally, like, doing something I'd never been able to do before and then losing it was just a reminder that, like, you know what, I'm not in the club. I never was in the club. I don't want to fight as hard as I would have to fight to be in the club. Mm -hmm. I'm good at creating my own club over here, so we're just going to do this now. I think that's kind of the theme of life for so many people right now. In almost every field, small business is like kind of create it yourself. And I feel like the people who don't for the next few years will just be left behind. I guess there's always an opportunity to create, but we're at a point where you still can. So that's cool. Well, I, hope that, I mean, I think there's always going to be a point where you can because people yeah, have probably. always and will always create. Um, whether they consider themselves to be a creative person or not, you're constantly right, right. creating. You're creating the outfit you put on this morning right, by right. pulling clothes out of your closet for whatever reason you chose what you chose. That is creating. Yeah. Um, and so something as little as that or something as big as creating a TV show or right. creating a comic book or whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. you are always you always have the agency to do that whether you feel like you do or not. You mm -hmm. make the choice to mm -hmm. create something. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to do it. It's up to you to sit down with a pen and paper and create ideas and make a plan for yourself. <laughs> And I know that it's so easy to get caught up in like, oh, I have to make money and I have to work and I have this nine to five and blah, 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 blah. And that's all true and you do have to do that. But I think once you flip the way you think about it to mm -hmm. the job owns me, to I own the job, like they pay me and that funds my project mm -hmm. and that funds mm -hmm. the life that I actually want. Right. And so the whole like starving artist thing, like you have to be, you know, a waiter or whatever, you don't. Right. You just have to think of the job that you have during the day as the thing that keeps you going mm -hmm. in the direction you want to go. Right. 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 So, yeah. No, I'm like agreeing with everything. That's just <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. There's, there's nothing I can add. Because all of your side yes, jobs yes. become your main job. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also, don't, I, I would even say don't view them as your side job. It's just your job. Yeah, yeah. If, yeah. if it pays you, it's your job. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like right, I right. work in corporate. It's the right. one. It's one of the things that I started out in. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 20 years old, I was in the corporate office at a hedge fund, and <coughs> I was like, "Oh, I have to get out of here as soon as possible because this is hindering everything." But I was making more money than my dad <laughs> at 20 years old. That's crazy. And I couldn't wait to get out of there. But like, right. stupid me, had I stayed there. You know, like with an adjust for inflation, like the amount of money oh we make can be ridiculous. Yeah. And I'd be able to do yeah. whatever I want. And uh, like you said, I think there's a shift happening, mm -hmm. but I think that shift is more so people are starting to realize that I don't necessarily have to do this or that. Right. It's right. And. Right. Right. You can do both. Yeah, it's nice people are finally seeing that. Yeah. Because a lot of people say, I don't understand. You do this, but you do that too. And it's like, ah. Don't, yeah. don't get me started on that one. <laughs> but that's cool because people are realizing you can do a lot of different things yeah. and you're not and you're you're in, you're in charge. You're hired now to also be a ceramic maker. Yeah. yeah, and you're in charge of what you want. Yeah, yeah for sure. And so I'm 68 and I'm still doing crazy stuff. And I'm yeah, still being creative, creative. And I don't think of it as, hey, you're 60. I'm thinking of it as, this is what I want to do. Right. This is what I want to do. I don't care what you're, where you're supposed to, whoever says you're supposed to be in a certain place at this time. Yeah. It's, it's like... I mean, the, tr the truth of it is, regardless of whether we're talking about career choices or jobs or whatnot, you could get in your car and drive across the country and turn off your phone and never be heard from again. And that would be great. If that's what you want to do, right. Right. Yeah. wonderful. Right. right. But that's your choice. And you're free to make that choice at any time. Because no yeah. one is stopping you. That is cool about this time, you know, since 2020. I feel like people can model their lives the way they want to. Well, like they always have a life. Yeah, but they didn't But think I think now the it's tolerance fun. level to do so is Yeah, low. exactly. And so if you yeah. want to disappear or you want to quit your job and go start a totally different career or start mm -hmm. your own business or 
go live in the forest in a tent, like do it. Right. Literally do it. There's no one stopping you from doing that. Right, right. That's a lot of leadership mindset, which a lot of people don't have. I know some people, one of my family, I don't think. I mean, I think, I think we're all born with it. I think it's beaten out of us. Yeah. Figuratively or right. literally, depending yeah. on your situation. But, yeah. but to make that decision, I think is, is selfish mm -hmm. in a good way. Mm -hmm. And we're told not to do that. We're told not to be selfish and not right. to only think of ourselves. <coughs> When, if you're in a situation where you feel like you have to leave your job or you have to make a change in your life, the only person you should be thinking about is yourself. Mm -hmm. Because to stay in that situation for the sake of someone else, mm -hmm. no. Right. Do you yeah. find that tragedy, because you had your own personal tragedy, and then the pandemic hit, you were in New York during the pandemic, do you find that that was the extra <coughs> push and the motivation that you needed to get everything done? I think I think it's certainly part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. I think it's a big part of the puzzle. But um, external things motivating you to do anything is always tough, right? Because then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. Like if seeing someone else win motivates you to work harder to also win, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. You're doing it to spite them. Mm -hmm. You have to want to do it because you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to shut everyone else out. So, like, did 2020 play into this and shut down all that? Like, absolutely. Because it made me stop and actually realize, like, now I don't want to do this anymore. And I want to go over here and I want to do that. Um, and it also, I think, on a more widespread level, gave everyone the opportunity to see that they also can do that. Mm -hmm. Because your job isn't real, time isn't real, money is not real. Everything that we're told and the structures in which we live are not real. They're mm -hmm. made up and we have a social contract with them to follow them. Mm -hmm. And we do that because it's the greater good for our fellow man. Mm -hmm. But we can also stop doing it. <laughs> I just want to comment, you know, I, I notice a lot of people, let's say someone's a swimmer or singer, whatever your profession is, theater, and you must have done it for at least 15 years? Oh, way longer. I Professionally for 15. Right, yeah. so at least 15. So after 15 years, at least for me, if I do something for like three to eight years, 10 years, it's like, okay, you kind of got a handle on this, now I want to do something else. And then people say, oh, you know, do you still teach or I taught workout classes? It's like, you kind of get it and now you want to do something else. And you know, the whole Jamie Lee Curtis thing for you, I think it makes sense for you to not want to do theater. It's like, you got it, you understand yeah. it, and now, if you believe in this life purpose thing, or even if you don't, whatever. Let's say you're here for 70 years, 100 years. There's so many other things you can do with your time. So it really makes sense. It's not, I don't really see it as quitting. It's like to go on to the next thing and take everything you've learned and build upon it. It just yeah. seems normal. But well, I don't think it's small-minded to go like that. And also, we, all, we are supposed to keep changing and growing. Yeah. There is no age that we hit where we're supposed to stop. Right. Like, right. Oh, I know everything now. Right. We're, we're done here. How 30 year olds that? <laughs> but um, well, I mean, as a thirty-something year old, like that's no thirty, know. like thirty. Oh, I'm thirty-year-old men, straight men, for example, they, they think they know. Just whatever. Let them get the thirty-nine and divorce, and then we'll talk. And less conversation. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to learn. Yes. Yeah. Um, but but growth and learning and changing is something we always right. should do. And so, I I mean, it's easy to get stuck in a job because you're comfortable. It's easy to get stuck in a job because the money is good or you feel like you need to be there or it's a sense of identity or community. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, with with you you as yourself being in charge of what you do now and what you do next, <coughs> you know, it's like... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. I feel all that. Social media times, where can people find out more about you, what's in their websites, all that fun stuff? Go. Google me. <laughs> um, I am on Instagram and TikTok and other platforms at Edward Miskey. Um, there's edwardmiskey.com. If you're in the city, you can buy my book at the Drop Up Bookshop on West 39th Street. Um, it's also available online on Barnes and Noble and Walmart and Indi Indigo and Amazon and all of them. All everywhere you buy books. <laughs> now, you were nice enough to uh, raffle off a uh, copy of your book, so yeah. why don't you tell us what, everybody, what they're going to win for the audience, what are they going to win? What you're winning, and God love you, is, uh, <laughs> brace yourself. <laughs>
Uh, it is, it's basically a, a, a telling of how, of basically where I was at from the time I was diagnosed until the time I was told I was cancer free and then after the fact. Um, it's written like a musical, it is act one, act two, and each chapter is framed within an existing musical. You don't have to like musicals to like the book, it just adds another layer of cheapiness if you, if you get the references. Um, but it chronicles basically what happens to you physically, emotionally, otherwise, when something like this happens. It's, it's very, it's less about cancer and more about the human experience of what it's like to have it. Um, I talk a lot about dating, sex, relationships, how your view on the world changes, all from like, I did this, I did that, blah, 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 blah. Um, I got into a fight with a cop once on Fifth Avenue because I thought he was being rude to me and he actually yeah, really so. wasn't, it was my fault. <laughs> But, you know, it's a lot of different stories about how I got through. All right, so everybody has their raffle ticket. Get one copy. This is a pick the one, pick the winner. This is not for the faint of heart at all. <laughs> pick one, and all right. the winner is... Are we going by last last three or four digits? Yeah, last three or four. Last three, okay. Uh, 1050. 1050? One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. There you go, all right. Yeah. 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 All right, we always like to give away something at every last show at the East Middle Public Library. Um, well, uh, final thought time. So, Ed, do you have any final thoughts? Final thoughts? Um, I mean, listen, go out, go out into the world and tear it down and make it the way that you want it to be. For and they tear it down. Right. Final thoughts I think we're on a panel with one of the most amazing human beings <laughs> that we've ever been on. Very yeah. inspirational. Yeah. You should take that book on tour and just put plugs up people's rear ends and get out and do it. There's a chapter about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone who's done theater for 15 years or even two years, you deserve the rest. I'm not even trying. No way. You record that thing once and you send it to them. That's where I'm at. So Great. respect for theater people. Holy crap. It's a hard job. It's a hard job. Yeah. yeah. So my final thought is this. Uh, thank you very much for being a guest on our live show for our live show audience. Yeah. 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 Um, you're a really interesting and inspiring person. Yeah. And I'm very glad that you reached out to us to yeah. come down and be a guest on the show. Well, so thank, thank you so much. And much continued success. And we did talk about some stuff uh, before we started recording. And best of luck with that. And Thank let you. us know and come back when you get that fingers crossed done. I will. So that about does it for this week on the So that about does it for this week on the Came Friend Radio. Join us right here and every week on this radio station. If you miss any part of the show, okay. really not even gonna. All right, fine. Duh. Thank you. Um, go to www.camefrenio.com. Um, make sure you guys go to the East Mill Public Library, www.eastmill.info for our next live show. It's going to be on Wednesday, April 10th at 7 p.m. with professional stand-up comic Brian McKenna. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of live show. Yay! Yay! You've been listening to It Came From The Radio with Matt Torrance. The views of 